are the nameless MCA group. We're still, still trying to figure that out. Um, I'm Olivia Pedres. I'm Victoria Kuzma. I'm Audrey Temple. And I'm Justin Zay. So today we're going to talk about Anvil, the story of Anvil. Um, we're going to cover three unexpecteds that happen in the movie and then connect that to the anthology of rock and roll. Um, so Audrey, would you like to begin with the first one? Um, I guess we're going to kick it off with the idea that Anvil actually kind of has a false view of themselves um, and how successful they actually are. Um, and we can see this um, in the beginning when JJ French from The Twisted Sister states that Anvil was able to outperform them at one point, but they're actually no longer able to do this while other bands are able to outperform them at this point. Yeah. Um, so JJ French, he sort of admits the to this like nostalgic vibe of Anvil. Um, he walks up to them, uh, walks up to the main sort of uh, leader, uh, singer, guitarist, Lips, and uh, points out the clothing. Specifically states like this shit just stays the same. It's the same clothing. Clothing. It still stinks. By the way, <laughs> it just touches on this like nostalgic aspect of like they're clinging on to their youth and um, what happened before because Anvil was this super influential band that people admit, even like John Z, the manager for Metallica, said that Anvil formed the heavy metal formula for any heavy metal band that exists today. They were sort of like the originators of everything. But over time, that nostalgia faded and, and the group also grew up. And along with that, they sort of faded as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And I think the reason, like, the reason why we, we bring this up is because we think that the reason they're, not, they're unsuccessful is because they're just not very good. And like, they really, they're, they're just like, they're not get, gaining any traction in the end of their lives because they're not creating good music that labels think will be listened to and that they'll make money off of. So all the compliments that they're getting in the beginning of the film by famous, famous musicians are based on the nostalgia of them when they were young performers. So these artists like Anvil, they're hearing these like incredible compliments from people that they look up to and they they like internalize it and it, they still think that they're a great band. It's why that it's why they stayed together for so long still thinking that like they were going to get a big break, mm -hmm. you know. And they and they never get compliments on their shows. Um, I, I, they, they never get compliments on their new stuff. Um, they get people who come and seem, seemingly enjoy their shows, but we don't see anyone of importance uh, reminding them of how good their shows are. It's all compliments of the past and how they used to outperform people and how that's, it's kind of implied then that they're gonna outperform them in the future. Um, and, and I think that uh, going back to something we said before about um, how they, and they, they have, they had all this success when they were young, and then they kind of didn't grow up and tried to cling on to that forever. Mm -hmm. While in the meanwhile, in the mean, in the meantime, their fans all grew up and matured past their music. Um, and but the the problem was that these people are getting older. These this group of guys are getting older, and so they can't talk, tap into this young audience that um, the that they could before because they can't relate to them because you would never see a group of like like teenagers the, the type that would listen to the to punk metal uh metal music um going to a performance for someone like a new band that they found that's that's like you know 50 50 year old men like you would see they want to go see because because it's not like we're seeing the beatles we're not talking about the Beatles or like Prince or like Michael Jackson. We're talking about um, like a, a group of people who are kind of filling a role that a lot of people could replace them with. And they just got some traction and they're trying to cling onto it, but they're, they're really failing at that in a way. I mean, in a sense they did get replaced because they weren't able to evolve and all they did was like replicate their older music. They were never, never able to grasp onto a new audience or a more evolved audience um mm -hmm. like or just like a diverse audience in general like it's all the same age group they're all white it's all the same people that are listening to their music yeah. i definitely think this 
this can tie into a discussion of ontology because if anvil was a sort of essence and the originator of heavy metal then we're talking about like extended guitar sol solos like um loud distorted distorted and thick sounds but also like the sort of loudness and aggression that you only sort of get from youth from this idea of like rebellion yeah. and if that's the ontology if that's like the essence of heavy metal then as soon as you sort of grow up and you sort of lose that naiveness like being able to write a song about the spanish inquisition or like thumbs hanging like that's the sort of goofy meany naiveness that heavy metal is like known for that anvil was known for and then the second they took it too seriously it sort of it faded it's supposed to be like a joke they, they commercialized it they in a way yeah. sold out um and that's like the one thing you can't do as a metal band yeah, yeah. and then on top of that like what you, you were saying about this goofy naiveness that they had you can't that's charming and like endearing as a as as kids and even as 20 year olds but like when you get older it becomes kind of cringy and pathetic in a way because it's like they're not yeah yeah they're not waking up to deal with reality they're not living their life they're like like you can uh, in a scene we're going to talk about later um where lips is like all emotional and talking about how they're going to be rock stars and it's the dream it's like they've been talking about that for 40 years, you know, and he's so emotional and he's like, and, and, and the, I feel like they're, they're, um, they're, they've been chasing this one thing and they kind of, they got it, but like they didn't feel like it fulfilled them. And so then they had to keep on going and they were like, okay, we need more, we need more. Yeah. Um, and it kind of set them into this vicious cycle of like not ever being content with what they had and always wanting more to the point where they exceeded their their potential, and it became impossible for them to get more. One of Graysick's points um, that he's talked about was that rock musicians can support their careers um, in like if they didn't have live performances at all. So I think that's like important when applied to this band because they can't do that. Their live performances are not keeping them afloat at all, and and. Uh, yeah, their no, no no their records aren't keeping them afloat because they're just not very good. So the only thing that they can do is perform live and hope that people show up. And people still aren't showing up um, because their records aren't very good. Like they talked to a record label much later after they finally got their thirteenth album professionally done, professionally made in a studio, like with all the technology to make it sound good because all their records before sounded like shit. And they're basically like, Lips literally is like, it's not justice to have something that sounds this good. And the and the label, the, the guy they're talking to basically ignores it because he, he doesn't think it sounds good. Like he's like, yeah, but like, I don't think this is a right fit because I don't, he, they don't like the sound. They're just overdone and they, they don't have a, good idea of reality and what they should sound like. Grace also mentions that like recordings are the primary link between the rock artist and the audience and they're the primary object of critical attention. I think that's why they were successful in the beginning because they did work with um, sound studios and like managers that knew how to sort of perfect and perform that recording. And then as soon as they sort of slipped away from that and then started recording stuff on their own, it just it was bad like mm -hmm. because the essence of rock and metal is like in the recording then if that's bad then everything and they haven't evolved yeah. since then either so like all their yeah. shit uh records that were in between the original like well-made one and the well-made one now like they haven't evolved so they're just playing it's the same thing, the yeah. same they're, thing they're recycling before. they're also um they don't have they have terrible management um, <laughs> and and it really was to their detriment because like a lot of their tour was them trying to figure out how to get to shows when they, they missed the train like they were running around and where was it like check the check like like they were just like oh Prague Prague yeah, yeah they, they couldn't figure out where they were how to get there and they were late to their performance and like that sucks especially when you're not seeing like someone who's super huge and Ed like you know like Ed Sheeran or something like like if if they're if you're if it's like you tiny, always pick Ed Sheeran. I guess I guess I don't know. I've I've I watched that um that, that movie where he the yesterday and Ed Sheeran's in that and oh, so yeah, that's yeah. what's been on my mind a lot. But <laughs> um like 
you don't have as much tolerance for that type of bullshit. Like yeah. when you're when you're a um a serious band, like or like you can they you can get away with that, but then then Anvil is really pushing their luck with their with their fans and and it they don't mean to, you know, you know, and and but it, they end up like kind of shooting themselves in the foot by like hyping up a tour and then underperforming in a way. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just so sad. You have yeah, it is very tragic. Walking around, bald spots on the back of their heads, like idealizing what was, and um, yeah, it, it, when you have like a fifty-year-old singing a song that they were in high school. It's just kind of pathetic. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I feel like the only thing that makes them marketable is the nostalgia. Yeah. And oh, like, yeah. they're trying to cling on to that so much. Yeah. Or like, I feel like Lips is trying to like, disregard that that's what it's really about. Yeah. So this sort of leads us into the second um, unexpected part of uh, the documentary. Uh, this part, the scene takes place halfway around the movie where Lips has just sort of finished this um, phone banking, marketing, salesman job and he didn't receive any money for it. It jumps into this conversation with Rob and Lips um, about how it's super difficult to raise money. Uh, people have had to like remortgage their households to uh, raise enough money to film this, to record this new album. Um, it's this super emotional scene where Lips sort of cries at the end because everything's on his, it, everything's his responsibility. Uh, the financial aspect of the band is his to take care of. It's a sort of unexpected scene and moment, um, especially in a heavy metal documentary where you sort of expect it to just be anger, aggression, and success. And this is revealing the reality, the financial difficulties and, and the emotional aspect of it. I definitely see what you're saying there. I think that um, also heavy metal is really like it's about emotion. It's about um, expressing this kind of anger. But deep down, I think that the the anger that's expressed in the in this music is really like to mask kind of a deep emotional like sadness. Um, and then, but the thing is, if you start talking about that sadness and start expressing it, uh, like really it becomes like against what heavy metal is supposed to be against the ontology of heavy metal because and it, because it's really about like dealing with pain by covering it up with anger um and 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 um suppressing this negative emotion but they don't talk about this and they don't recognize this so so they so if you were to ask ask someone who's into this music if you were to ask someone who's like really passionate about this they wouldn't um they wouldn't recognize that but then when Lips starts, you know, showing emotion like this, when Lips kind of breaks character, um, it, it makes, it's, it's, it's like, it's like not allowed, you know, it's, it's very unexpected, um, which, which was, and he shouldn't, you know, he shouldn't be, um, he shouldn't be crying as a rock star. He should be screaming and like biting the head off a bat or like, you know, he, he shouldn't, he should be expressing his sadness through violence and anger and not through actual emotion yeah and i feel like at this point um lips is like not able to accept that he has to deal with adult responsibilities because like in his glory days and like when he was creating this like super rebellious and like new music like that's when he really wasn't dealing with like the real world like at that point they were like making money, they were a lot more successful, they were well known, like, they were like, living the dream life, and like, at this point, he's like, dealt, he's dealing with all these responsibilities that like, he's not, I mean, I guess he's not really used to yet, they're not like, facing adult life yet, and then like, um, in terms of like, creating new music, and like, producing something that people will like. Mm -hmm. And something that'll make money. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of like heavy metal, we touched upon this, but it's just like rooted in this like teenage angst. Yeah. Like, once again, like Spanish Inquisition, what does that have to do with like reality? It's yeah. just, um, like comedy in a and way. Yeah, like it's very much just this jokes to me. We're gonna go on stage and play guitar with a dildo and we're gonna make money. Mm -hmm. And then that's why it's sort of 
it, like Justin said, like it breaks the ontology, it breaks the expected norm of like heavy metal in its format when we see them actually struggling, when we see that like it's difficult and it's hard and they're not making the money that they ex expect to and Lips does have this sort of idealized version of like where mm -hmm. they should be. Yeah, I was I was watching this the scene we're talking about and like he truly believes that he can like save this band like he's like the hero of the band and he has this idea that everybody expects him to help them make it everyone's counting on him, everyone's counting on him. and i think it's such a, a delusion that people have been putting in for so like into him for so long that like they're so good and mm -hmm. of course he's the lead singer so he would think that like it's his responsibility um yeah, he, he definitely has a delusion of grandeur in that in that regard. He thinks that he is that he he has so much faith in this band and that he doesn't realize where their shortcomings are and he can't self reflect enough to um like to, to improve things because mm -hmm. there I, I think I think and and I'm not exactly sure where you know where to go with this, but I you know, there's a definitely distinct difference between Anvil and Ozzy Osbourne and and those and like the people who are still relevant today and still great today and my theory is that the the that it's because Ozzy Osbourne number one was like significantly more successful obviously but like he didn't cling to the um he didn't try and like continue evolving he in a way stayed nostalgic by like like quitting while he was ahead and then riding his wave in a more appropriate way so for instance you see him you see his per tv appearances where you know for instance there I, I saw this video where he's at the dentist and they're trying to knock him out but he's taken so many drugs in the past yes. that he can't they literally can't knock him out with the gas and so it's like it's like his personality stays alive because he's not taking himself seriously and he's not Try, he's he's retired. He's not trying to keep on, like making it big again. Anvil's really, like, kind of failed in that regard. Failed in the regard of of remaining important and remaining like influential, um, even though they tried harder than any of these other people. Yeah, um, I just think it's super important to like reiterate like how important to the ontology of rock and roll it is to record in a studio because it's where they make their music. Like. Let's see, page 15, just so you know. It says, uh, Lennon's voice at the end of a 12 hour recording session is essential to its effect. So like, they don't have that in any of their music because they're not, they don't have the, the equipment and the time to record everything, record individually, like each sound and put it together. They just don't have that. And I think that would be like, that's essential to what makes rock and roll so, so big and so popular. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I, I think of the, the final curveball that was thrown to us in this movie was uh, the paintings by Rob the Drummer. Um, they're, like, the main ones that stuck out to me were the massive anvil surrounded in Canadian flags, the, mm -hmm. um, the, the also the drum set, um, the, the, like, kind of the lonely drum set, and then finally the, um, the shit in the bathroom, um, that... <laughs> And he talks us through these paintings. He talks us through the, um, like, the symbolism, the, he, the, um, the intention behind them. And he takes them so seriously. Um, and it doesn't, it's, it's convincing to me. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's always hard to tell if someone's kind of kidding or, or, or being serious. But, like, at least for the, the first one, which is the anvil, like, his interpretation of the anvil in the park um like and like all the little details around it like the people that show scale that show how big it is you know which which then implies how grand and like and like um you know you know cosmic this this band is um and and he compares it to like the 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 pyramid the egyptian pyramids um and it's like saying it's like a god like that's so you know, exaggerated and like campy, I guess. Like, yeah. like he, he doesn't realize that metal is supposed to be, um, you know, supposed to not take itself so seriously. It's supposed to just be 
music that people enjoy because of you know because of the emotion it's not supposed to be like the beatles you know mm -hmm. um yeah. and then and then there's the 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 painting of the drum set which is like what they leave behind when they're not recording <laughs> which is just so deep and he believes in this and he thinks that other people he, he like thinks that he's like this misunderstood artist <laughs> um and that leads to the the final one which is the the um like the sausage of shit in the toilet um which is and his wife even doesn't believe in this painting um and like kind of exiles it to the bathroom um but the it's it's like he really thinks that this is something that's telling a story and he thinks that it's like unique and 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 he um uh like like talks about like the texture and like he gets all excited about this and it's and it's like, it just, you can't take that seriously. And it seems like he feels like he's like a misunderstood Picasso or Mozart um, and just this revolutionary, like visionary artist. And you know, he's not. They're just like extremely self-involved. And I feel like that is also shown in the paintings. Like how big the anvil is. That's what it is, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Anvil. Yeah, like how big it is, like on the scale and then you can see how he's like s clearly self-involved and like thinks he's above other people like with mm -hmm. like just the drum set you know mm -hmm. like that's yeah, his instrument yeah yeah, yeah and, then, and then even like the canadian flags and the mm -hmm. anvil showing like it's a little bit of character but if you look at the paintings they're actually very simple you know mm -hmm. like like the there's not much in the foreground and the background it really kind of looks unfinished in a way but it's not and that kind of just shows to how he's not like a incredible <laughs> artist you know. I think the painting is also just super important in general to like, it is, it, painting is such like a, a peaceful way to like, <laughs> like, like to put creativity into something, which is so not rock and roll. The poop is on my screen, I literally need to. <laughs> um, it, and it's, that's so not rock and roll. And like for him to, to do that and also be so like, he's definitely invested in it. It's something he really enjoys yeah. doing. And I think that it like, against the ontology yeah and also I, the the whoever the filmmakers really didn't go into to what he thought about the band today because a lot of what he talked about was the nostalgia that's what he enjoyed about it mm -hmm. and when they they end up fighting him and lips mm -hmm. end up fighting which they fight a lot because that's what bands do mm -hmm. he just wants he's like he says something about wanting to pursue something else and i think that like lips keeps them so like He's so, um, he puts so much energy into this band and has so much confidence in this band getting bigger that he, he's not going to let his best friend do something else. His best friend is the, there, they make the band. So he's not going to let him go and do something else. Like if he wanted to paint, if that's something he wanted to do, that would go completely against the ideas of rock and roll and what has been in their life for so long. Um, and that's just not not allowed right <laughs> like, yeah, yeah i think um just one more point about the painting if anyone has ever been confused about camp all we have to look at is that poop uh <laughs> painting because it's the way that he, that rob just like like coddles it like like softly touches the texture <laughs> yeah. of the poop it's mm -hmm. so and, and tries to add a level to the yes. experience like it's like supposed to be so genuine and innocent and serious but it like it fails, you know. It feels like, like he's gonna like start crying. Yeah, he's like, I don't understand why my white, my white, my, my uh, <laughs> stroke moment. Okay, <laughs> like why my wife doesn't want it like out in the living room. Yeah. yeah. Like this is yeah yeah he's, and he takes himself so seriously. And also in a way like, the with the drum set like, it's it's kind of showing how all each of the band members think that. They're mo well, I, I don't I don't want to say each, but like him and Lips are clashing because they think that they're the leader and the most important person in the band, when clearly like Lips is probably more important. But like when, you know, in order to show what they leave behind when they leave the recording studio and the, when they leave the stage, it's the it's the drums. It's not the it's not the microphone, you know, it's it's showing him and, and also like he also wears his his like his like bandana do rag thing that says anvil on all it all the time like yeah, all the time a signature look you know he's he's trying to embody the band yeah. 
while he's not and he wants to be the big rock star he wants to be the leader he wants to be you know the john Le lennon of the group when he's not you know it's which is which john is unfortunate the he's, he's the ringo <laughs> would you guys say that like i don't want to like thesis this but like would you say that um because they didn't follow the ontology of rock and roll that's why they weren't successful yes in a way i think i think that they they also follow it too much to to a to a point and i'll explain because like they they try so hard to be genuine but the thing is like it's it's the fact that they're trying to be genuine and they're not just they're not just it you know like the fact that they put on this mask um and they're really like sensitive guys at heart, but they're 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 really pretending in order to be rock stars. Um, and it, and they don't they don't keep up the act off when the cameras are off, which I think is kind of part of the reason. And people can sense that, you know. And then going back to like these other these other actual successful people, like like Ozzy Osbourne, who does keep up the act, like he he he. He will, you know, he is yeah, yeah, like he'll do cocaine on stage, but then he goes back and does it again later. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I, I think that they're, they're kind of just, they're, they're too tame in a way. Um, but at the same time, they're too wild because like, they're not organized enough. You know, they're, yeah. Yeah. I think the documentary itself and the way that it's filmed, um, like it's a documentary about heavy metal, but it's also very much like edited and formatted in a way that is very heavy, heavy metal-ish. Like there is a lot of like random cuts and jumps and, and a lot of like loudness. They're showing these moments of like extreme emotion and then sincerity with the paintings. Um, so I think, yeah, ontologically the documentary itself reflects that, that like loud mess that sort of led them to their failure, you know? Okay, so yeah, I, I, I think that this movie ultimately is, is act, is, was actually quite sad. Um, I think that they, that it's, it's trying to pretend that it has a happy ending where they have this big performance in the end. But in a way, ultimately, like, they're not going to be content. And they're going to, after that, they're going to be like, okay, we're making our next album, you know, it's, it, it isn't over. Like we just have, we're gonna ride this wave of momentum, but this wave of momentum does not seem to be a wave. It seems to be a wall that they like, you know, <laughs> keep on having to to they like they like summit at one point, but then they have to climb the next one, and the next one is you know much higher. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, and Audrey, you you had an interesting point about um, how they're never going to be content. What, what were you saying? I kind of forget what I said, but I'll try. Okay, um, basically, I guess they, yeah, I mean, at this point, they're never going to be content with the amount of success that they have, because I think they're always reaching for more, and their fan base has grown up. They're not in that same rebellious phase that they were when, like, they were younger, you know, like they, they have evolved past that. And like Anvil's not, has not evolved for them, for their fan base. So there's nothing they can do because they're not appealing to like this new generation of like rebellious teenagers, which is like where you would find, um, where that would be relevant in like maybe like hip hop or like pop music these days and like not in rock or rock and roll or anything like that. But, um, yeah, I think, um, like I mentioned before, Anvil's definitely profiting, profiting off of nostalgia, and we see that in clips and scenes of like 50 year old, 60 year old fans drinking beer through their noses. Um, it's sort of very, it's very stagnant, very sad, um, especially when you look at, you know, scenes of like family and, and sisters and, and wives dealing with this crazy mess that has been going on for 30 years. Um, so I think the documentary does a, does a really good job of pointing um, at topics of nostalgia, authenticity, and like specifically ontology um, of heavy metal. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good Yeah, um, well, yeah, I think that about wraps it up. Um,
<laughs> yeah. We will be back soon with another video, hopefully. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.